Marsha Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today, we are really going to navigate the journey. My goodness. Today's topic is, in keeping with what's going on in the world, is this the beginning of the Civil War II? And so I have asked a dear friend, my new best friend, and you know I only talk to best friends, my new best friend is, again, a cousin. And this is a dear, dear, brilliant cousin. And he is the Reverend Nicholas Hood III. And he's in Detroit. So we are trying to ask people in different cities across the country, what's going on in their city? How is this all playing out? Is it really the beginning of the civil, another civil war? Are we in the middle of the civil war? Where are we and where do we go from here? So, Nick, aloha. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you too. He is, uh, like I said before, he's one of the tons of cousins we have that we don't get to meet because we're thousands of miles apart. So Nick, tell us about Nick. Well, no, let me start from the beginning, how we are related. Nick's father and my father were brothers. That's as simple as I can get it. And we come from a long line of activists. Our grandmother, I don't know how old she was when she went to the March on Washington and all of her children were raised to be activists, to be a part of the community. And I remember my Aunt Dolly told me when I asked her about living in Gary and she said, any place that you live can be great if you take the time to make it so. Okay. It works. So back to Nick. Uh, so tell us about Nick, first of all. Well, Marcia, let me begin by saying thank you for inviting me to be on your program. Number two, I just have uh, gotten to meet Marcia. For those of yes. you who are watching the program, I am 68 years old. I'll soon be 69 in October. Uh, but I've met Marcia not through uh, Ancestry.com or AfricanAmericanAncestry.com or any of the other DNA searches, but um, we, we have always been related. We just have not met each other. Yes. You know, your life for the last 50 years has been in um, um, Hawaii, and my life for the last 50 years has been in Detroit, Michigan. I was born in New Orleans in the segregated South. My father, uh, your, he would be your uncle. My uncle, yes. Uh, was a founding member of the SCLC. I don't know if you know that. Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, he, he was the secretary of the New Orleans Improvement Association. And uh, the SCLC was actually founded in New Orleans. A lot of people think it's an Atlanta operation because that's where Dr. King worked um, you know, up to his death with his father. Mm -hmm. But actually Dr. King and leaders of the movement organized the SCLC in New Orleans. And your uncle was one of the original signers. Well, like I said, it, it makes sense. Like everybody that I know in this family is an activist of some sort. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, I am really, really pleased uh, since uh, we've been talking with each other for the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's been an absolute delight. And, uh, you know, and so I'm honored to be on your program. And uh, I don't know if your guests know anything about me. I'm the pastor of the Plymouth United Church of Christ in Detroit, Michigan. I'm a former member of the Detroit City Council for two terms, eight years. Um, and uh, I have my uh, feet in activism, so to speak. Um, I am really thrilled with what I'm seeing right now happening across America and parts of the world where uh, 
you know, your title is, is this the, uh, what, a second civil war? civil war? Yes. I'm not sure it's a civil war, but what I am sure of is that for the first time in a long time, uh, progressives and people who want racial change in America are coming together across racial lines. And I like it that um, to me, what I'm seeing happening, the young people in my church call it alignment. And what they mean by that is uh, young white folk, young Asian folk uh, and folk of other uh, ethnic persuasions are coming together uh, really to support Black Lives Matter, to, to profess that uh, they don't agree with uh, racism, they don't agree with the policies of many of their parents. And I think it's just absolutely tremendous. I never thought uh, I would see at this stage of my life, young white people uh, joining hands with young black people where the young white people are saying, we're sorry, you know, and we are standing with you. When the quarterback of the New Orleans Saints, Drew Brees can text out a, a racist uh, rant and then his wife follows it with a almost a dissertation apologizing for not only what her husband said, but apologizing for white entitlement. I think it's a beautiful thing. So I'm not sure we're leading to a civil war, but there are a lot of opportunities for change that are happening. While I was waiting for your show to come on tonight, I was scrolling through the New York Times online version and uh, one of the articles I missed today uh, is one that says that the uh, military is considering uh, a proposal to rename 10 bases, uh, you know, training bases that are named after Confederate soldiers. And That's I, I was astounded. I, I didn't know that we had any of that. And, you know, from a, as I said, you know, I have a political background. I can understand uh, your uncle who was before me, my father, Nick Hood Sr., was a member of the Detroit City Council for 28 years. I, I cannot top that. But one of the things you learn in politics is how the process works. And I can only imagine, you know, with uh, 10 military bases named after Confederate soldiers, uh, some of whom I don't think were particularly distinguished, all of them were traitors. Every one of those 10 were traitors against the United States of America because they fought against the United States of America. But I suspect that the reason why those bases are named after Confederate soldiers was appeasement. And part of what the young white people are saying today and young, white, uh, young black people are saying is this is not a time for appeasement. This is a time to really make things right. And so I think it's a great opportunity for America. Well, let me interject right here, the base of General John Bell Hood was our great, great, great grandfather. Yes. <laughs> we are so, the descendants, descendants of slaves. We are descendants of the Confederate yeah, General Confederate John General. Bell Hood. <laughs> and, and I've said it, a th everybody that knows me knows I've said it a thousand times. I don't have a problem with him being white. What I do have a problem, because I'm a snob, I do have a problem with him being the idiot. He lost his whole tribe, his whole troop, and they named the base after him. Now, how can you lose all your men? And then he left his wife with 10 children and just left her with these are white children. Can you believe what a man he was? And they named the base after him? I mean, that's... Yeah. No, well, yeah. and. <laughs> It, it goes along with what I was saying that you have soldiers who were traitors against the United States of America uh, and they're honored with military bases. Now, and that's only one small example uh, of the, the magnitude of what's happening now. Uh, the whole movement across the nation to defund the police uh, is fascinating. Uh, but you know, in a big city like Detroit, uh, Michigan, a big part of what the police do is they pick up people with emotional and mental problems. And I watch them every day 
as I ride up and down the street, somebody is sitting on a curb or outside a bus stop and the poor police have to stop and uh, attend to these people. They end up taking them to the mental health wards uh, as a minister. Uh, I've had to go to the emergency room a lot over, for the last 44 years, uh, not as a patient, but as a pastor. And the, the parking lot is full of police cars. And wow. when these young men and young women sign up to be police, I don't think they signed up to be mental and emotional health care workers. And so uh, this movement to defund the police, uh, I didn't, I'm not sure if the people who are organizing it really exactly know what the end game is, where they're going. But one of the things that they are saying that I think is right, which is the police don't need to be mental health care workers. You know, they need to focus on real crime. And uh, so I think that that's going to be a good thing. I've been uh, concern with some of the voices I've heard from the police departments around the country, uh, particularly some of the police union leaders uh, who seem to have a knee-jerk knee -jerk reaction to change, any kind of change. Uh, but I think that this is a good thing. And for the president on down, uh, the white leadership in the Senate, uh, in the, the House of Representatives, the United States Supreme Court, when they live the young white people who are protesting, they see their sons and their daughters, kind of like in the middle and early 60s with the Freedom Riders. Um, black people were being killed in the South. They were being brutally, you know, uh, treated in the South. But when young white people start getting beaten up and killed, all of a sudden, America took another view. And so this is a tremendous opportunity for America right now. Well. Uh, when I said, is this another, a second civil war? A couple of years ago, I read an article written by an astrologer who said that the planets were aligning just as they were for the civil war. And I didn't earmark the article, so I can't quote who it was. And I've kicked me a thousand times for not earmarking the article. So then... Last year, I typed in, you know, about the alignment. 50 different articles came up about where things are going. And it all pointed to not a civil war, but a revolution. And I think that's where we are. We are seeing when you see that many people in the street, even here in Hawaii, we had three days of protest. Every island, every island, thousands of people showed up and all kinds of colors. And the Hawaiians led one of the, meet, um, what do you call it? Uh, protest. And it wasn't really a protest because I mean, come on, when you sit down on the grass with candles, that's kind of, you know, anyway, it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And, um, and in South Korea, they filled balloons with some kind of message and sent them off to North Korea. And all around the world, people are into whatever it is, wherever they can, let me put it that way. And it's been just beautiful to watch. I've been been stuck to this television for two weeks now. Mm -hmm. um, my husband was in the Navy for 30 years. He's retired uh, with Agent Orange. Thank you, Uncle Sam. Like everybody that went to Vietnam has Agent Orange. And, but being his age, he's 89, and having been through all those years in the Navy when it was segregated, his blood pressure was up and it kept going up, up, up. And now this morning, he watched the funeral, of course. And then this morning, it was back down. So it was that emotional roller coaster he was on watching, going through all of this, which, you know, I think everybody did. And it's it's exciting and it's hopeful. Yeah, one of the interesting things about this uh, protest movement across America is that it's, uh, it, it's not focused on one leader, not even one or two leaders. For instance, in Michigan, uh, one, are the protests here have been nonviolent. Two, for the most part, number two, 
uh, it's hard to nail down who actually is the leader or leadership. We have protest movements spanning from Detroit, Michigan, all the way to Howell, Michigan, maybe farther than that. And the leadership is comprised of people in some instances, they may not even know each other. Uh, but what they do know is that they want change in America and they want racial change. You know, you can spin the, the death of George Floyd any way you want to. Uh, I read from some conservative pundits that George Floyd was not a good person or this or that. But regardless of what kind of person he was, he was a human being. And no human being <clears throat> deserves to die uh, on a chokehold with a, under the knee of a police officer. And so you have young people across the racial spectrum who have come together to say that black lives matter. They're important. Black people are just as important as white people. And we're going to keep working until real change comes in America. For those of us who lived through the civil rights movement, there was the, you know, Martin Luther King uh, began his involvement in 1955, December to 1956, December in uh, Montgomery, Alabama with a bus boycott. And the conclusion of that was the uh, you know, integration of the bus lines in terms of where people could sit. Um, and then that propelled him to the leadership of the SCLC. And there were, there were identifiable endpoints. You had the Civil Rights Legislation of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and those were concrete events that not just black people, but white people could look at and say, there's a victory. Uh, it was substantial change uh, and improvement from what existed prior to that. Uh, but Dr. King realized that even with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act, Act of 1965, that America still uh, was segregated in terms of economic disparity. And you know his point was, what good is it uh, if you can eat at a lunch counter if you can't afford a hot dog? And, uh, and so it's interesting that Dr. King, at the time of his death in 1968, had or was in the process of organizing a poor people's campaign and uh, the Poor People's March. And uh, it's unfortunate that he was killed uh, right you know, before that march. And I wonder sometimes right now what America and the world would be like had Dr. King lived. Uh, but what we're seeing now are the grandchildren of the movement, the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think something good will come out of this. Oh, of course it will. I mean, it's already, we've already seen good. Um, and just as a caveat, to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Our Hawaii freshman congressman, uh, Gill, Tom Gill, was a freshman congressman and he wrote Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. He was the floor manager for the Civil Rights Act. I think, now this is my theory, uh, that LBJ selected him to be the floor manager, A, from Hawaii, he couldn't go home, so he had to stay there. When everybody else got to go home for the weekends, he got to, had to stay, that's number one. And number two, he was as tall and as big and as arrogant as LBJ. So they went, you know, eye to eye. And so on the day of the March, March on Washington, uh, the president uh, said this was not, the I meant it was Kennedy told all the Congress do not go because they were scared it was going to be a riot. But he took his children and he went. And um, the, anyway, he came back and so now they're going to pass the bill. He's worked the floor and he had three Southern congressmen that told him, Tom, I love you. I want the bill to pass, but I can't vote for it. So I'm. we're going to not be there for the floor vote. He went to his grave 
no matter what I did, he went to his grave and wouldn't tell who those three people were. He promised we wouldn't, and he didn't. But, you know, I, I, I just have to give that caveat to out to Tom. He worked so hard for that bill here as well as in Washington. So we just need to add that little, little piece to it. Mm -hmm. Well, politics can make for strange bedfellows. And uh, one of the things politicians understand is that uh, they may not be together on today for a vote, but they will need each other tomorrow. And so I, I understand that very clearly, you know, mm -hmm. what you're saying. You know, I saw that on a local level in Detroit, but uh, I think that uh, what's going on now is great. And uh, I just hope that the leadership uh, in the protest movement set identifiables uh, so that they know when to turn it off, but they are moving in the right direction. And uh, you know, we have several young people in my church who participated in the marches in Detroit. And uh, I had a Zoom conversation with them uh, two Fridays ago to talk about, you know, how do you score uh, a movement? How do you, you know, when do you decide to get involved in a move in involved in a movement? When do you know uh, when it's right? When do you know that maybe you're uncomfortable with it? And uh, and how to maintain your integrity within a protest movement? I mentioned to you before um, it wasn't really a protest movement, but I think it was in the '90s there was a anniversary of the overthrow of Queen Lily Kugalani. Lily and my wife. Yeah. Yeah, we traveled to uh, Hawaii and visited, I think, seven islands uh, with many activists from the United Church of Christ and the uh, predecessor church, the Congregational Church in Hawaii. And it was interesting to watch the protest movements there. They reminded me of uh, the same kind of movements we have uh, in the mainland. And so we're all united in a lot of ways. And there are a lot of people who want to see good uh, they want to see peace and justice and equality uh, in the world. And it all starts locally. You know, all politics is local. And uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Uh, I'm not sure what I can add in terms of uh, the movements that are happening in Michigan right now. Uh, but uh, what I do know is that uh, something positive looks like it's on its way. Well, uh, just your presence and the ability to talk to somebody in other cities, like last week we talked to another cousin in New York, uh, Sheila. And uh, little Dolly said she was going to listen today, and she's in Gary. And that, wouldn't you know that we would get trucks going by right at this moment? Hopefully you can hear. I can hear <laughs> you hear very well. Trucks. I um, can hear and see you very well. Uh, I can I, hear. I can't even answer. hear. You can't hear? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't hear the trucks. Oh, great. <laughs> great. <laughs> you know that would happen right now. So, but um, again, it's such a pleasure being able to talk to you, to share, and all of these things. When we can do this again, when we have time, I thank you for your daily prayers. I look forward to it every morning. Um, and, and, I, and I look forward to your al aloha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and sometimes with a photograph of a flower. I love it. Yes. Well, thank you. I started that several years ago because a friend of mine has uh, terminal cancer. And he has been through 90 sessions of chemo. He's been through everything you can imagine, but he hangs in there. So I started doing that to send him a flower every morning. And now I'm up to 40 people every morning. It takes me a while to get a, all those people and now I hear from people when they say I didn't get my flower what's wrong are you okay <laughs> so 
So I'm glad you enjoy it. And I think we're out of time. Eric, are we, do we have any time left? He's not listening. Two minutes, oh, good, good, great. Okay, so real quick, where do we go from here? Well, Marcia, I would encourage uh, you and your guests in Hawaii and those who are you know, part of this uh, uh, program looking at it around the world to realize that uh, every person can make a difference in the world. It doesn't take much. Uh, and if you start in your neighborhood, Tip O'Neill, the uh, former uh, Speaker of the House said, all politics is local. And uh, some of the greatest leaders I've ever met are just block club leaders. And right in Hawaii, uh, I think it's very possible for people to look at how the society is working and to ask a simple question. Uh, can it be made better? And things are made better, not because politicians have the answer, but politicians are very, very practiced at listening to just ordinary people. They want to know, what do the people on the ground say? What do they think? And that's why in this movement right now, when uh, we have young people saying Black lives matter, all lives matter, uh, defund the police, Re reapportion uh, some of the monies for police departments, for mental health and other social services. That doesn't mean to eradicate the police, but it means to just, you know, reposition how uh, our expectations of the police. And, you know, th that's coming from the ground up. And uh, what that should tell all of us is that, uh, You've never done so much, accomplished so much that you can't make life better. And uh, so I am very, very enthused. I'm encouraged by what I see. And uh, I pray uh, for the day in our lifetime when we'll see justice rolling like waters, when poor people and hungry people are fed, when the thirsty are given drink. I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day when every person will, who wants work can get work. I talked to a young couple by Zoom uh, a couple hours ago in premarital counseling, and they're de trying to decide whether or not to get married because neither of them has a job. And uh, yeah, I told them, I said, look, when my wife and I got married 44 years ago, my church paid me as an assistant minister $10,000 a year before tax. I said, you know, they, they, more important than money is love. But young people need to hear that from somebody. And, uh, and, and for me, it was encouraging talking to the young couple because it's a realization that life goes on. So Marsha, I wanna thank you for well, inviting me to be a part of the program and our lives go on. <laughs> if, well, now one little, another caveat. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your wife mm -hmm. and his wife, is a federal judge. So she's, starting out she's, 44 she's years. The, she's the chief federal judge in the for the Eastern District of Michigan. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And, and that's something, that's by statute. You cannot politic to be the chief right. judge of a federal district. It's the judge who is the oldest active judge under 70 years of age. Oh, that's really? how you get to be the chief, yeah. That's how you get to be chief, just live long enough. Huh? You got to yeah. live long enough and, and be in your right mind. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, and, and she's sharp. She's really sharp. Yes, she is. So, yeah. yeah, she holds, holds me to task. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your camera person on Sundays. Uh, during the week, yeah. Your she week. I do these little uh, Facebook and YouTube videos. They're spiritual videos. And she, she gets a big kick out of pushing the button, the on and off switch. But she doesn't do it on Sundays. Sundays, yeah, Sundays. Uh, I've got a whole team of people. Got a whole team, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much. And we'll do this again. And, and aloha to everyone. And thank you so much. And we will see you next time. Aloha to you. <laughs>